I welcome everyone to it's a last call radio show.com exclusive here only on lasco radio show.com and now before the big fights happen tonight before we get to trout versus charla lara versus martin ocean and charla versus jackson i brought in a man who knows more about boxing and more about what's going on than most people inside the mainstream boxing industry once again join me from the boxing voice.com i give you it's uh nestor gibbs and nestor let's start off here with uh, the big fight everybody's talking about right now with triple header let's start with the, the main one though Charlo Trout. It's it's ironic because this was where a couple years ago Trout was. He was the young upcoming kid, needed a big name, and that was Miguel Cotto. Now fast forward, Trout's the big name, and Jamal Charlo needs that. You know, on his record, is it ironic? And how do you how much do you like this fight tonight on Showtime? Well, Chris, first and foremost, thanks for having me. And uh, is it ironic? I think uh, yeah, it's been shocking. That Jamal Charlo is a five to one favorite against uh, um, a former champion like Austin Trout, but there is a huge size differential. Obviously, uh, the young lion and Charlo has age on his side, on and and just the power that he possesses. But how much power does he really have? I mean, you, we talk about it off air. Who who's the signature win for Jamal Charlo? I don't like I like Charles. Don't get me wrong. They're, they're nice guys, they're good fighters, but, you know, Wilkie Camford, uh, Cornelius Brundridge, those aren't guys you go, wow, they're top ten guys. I mean, as most people on Twitter say, are the Charlos basically Al Heyman creations? Um, I know that he needs a signature win, or as he's calling it, and the rest of the media, Austin Trout is a name, but that's all that he is is a name. I mean, a guy like Jamal Charlo has all the intangibles, all the technical attributes to really uh, take care of Austin Trout. But we can go back to his biggest win, uh, which is K-9 Bundridge. Now, many would say, you know, that the win over Cornelius isn't a big deal. Uh, Cornelius was a 43-year-old fighter. But the point is, no other fighter, young, little, small, older, has ever handled Cornelius in that manner. Has Cornelius been knocked out before? Uh, I think so. One time by Joel Julio um, and another time by Shaku Powell. But uh, he's a decent middleweight champion former at the time. And, and you know that he was able to keep that idea of whether he lost it or not. Somehow he got himself in another eliminator and ended up being that champion. Uh, but Jamal basically retired him in my opinion. And I get that part, and, I, and as I said, I, there's a lot I like about Jamal Charlo. You look at Trout, and he, he has that one thing, I think, that Charlo doesn't have. He's known what it's like to have to fight through adversity. I mean, you beat Miguel Cotto in New York City. That's bigger than anything Charlo has done. I mean, that's basically the equivalent of going into Yankee Stadium and throwing a no-hitter against the Yankees back when they were in their prime. That never happens. Charlo's been in those wars. He's, I mean, sorry, Trout has been in those wars. He's beaten, you know, that big name. He's beaten guys and fought, fought guys like Canelo Alvarez, Arislandi Lara. He's held with them. He at least can go to Charlo and, and say, you have no idea what it's like for, you know, plan to go to hell. I know what it's like for a plan to go to hell, and I've improvised and won. How big is that for Charlo to show that when... The going gets tough. He's not going to just fold and start losing it. I mean, it's extremely big. It's make or break, right? This is the signature win that you, you were speaking of and guys like yourself are going to speak of that, that all young up-and-coming prospects or contenders need. But the problem is, Charlo's not any of those things. He's a champion now. And even though you don't hold a lot of stock in that community as Bundridge, when Bundridge is an awkward, um, very difficult fight. And he handled him accordingly. And I do think he has the stamina and the power. I mean, Trout has gone down probably three times in his last four fights. But, Chris, it sounds like you might be picking Austin Trout. Um, is that the case? I am picking on Trout. As I said, he's he's had that time. I mean, and look, I think he has a better trainer right now for him in terms of Barry Hunter, who has a, I call him a salty dog. He will let Trout know, you're screwing this up. You need to get you on your ass. You need to do something. He'll do that. I mean, he has had those couple fights where every fight back to the old Trout. And as I said, with Charlo, yeah, I know you said, yeah, Cornelius Brundridge is awkward. You know, he's a champion. 
But there was a huge size mismatch. And it was a 43-year-old guy who Charlotte knew he has no power. He has nothing I haven't seen. I can just... And what it was, it was basically a super middleweight taking on a blown-up 147 welterweight and just walking him down and beating him up. I don't see Charlo be able to do that against a guy like Trout, who's younger, slicker, and just a better pure boxer than Brundage is on his best day. Wow, Chris, you know, you, you're making me feel so bad right now because I took the uh, four-hour drive to Washington, D.C. to visit Austin Trout during his training camp for this fight and uh, still went on record on the Boston Voice Radio Thursday night to pick the younger Jamal Charlo because, again, Austin has gone down uh, from the power of lesser men. Uh, you know, he went down with Daniel Dawson. You know, he was down twice in that fight. You know, um, he, he's, he's, he went down in the East London Laura fight. He went down in the Canelo fight. You know, he, I think that this young, hungry line may bring him down, but keep him down. It'll be interesting to see. As I said, the Dawson fight, that was, a, I mean, you've seen guys like that where they go in, they look at an opponent, they overestimate them, or they underestimate them. I think that's what Trout did. And as I said, look, there's a good chance Charlo might you knock him out. You can underestimate once, Chris, but you got dropped twice in that fight. And look, I'm not taking anything away from this. is still Austin Trout, the former champion who beat Miguel Cotto, shared the ring with Saul Canelo Alvarez, went in there with guys like Islam Laura after losing right to Canelo. Like, he didn't take an in-between fight. He went straight after Laura to, to try to stay in the graces of the boxing fans, but at the same time, he still suffered these consecutive knockdowns. In the Canelo fight, next fight in the Laura fight, the next fight in the Daniel Dawson fight, you know, and then we all know the Hernandez fight itself wasn't a pretty fight, which is his last win that he's coming off of. You know, that was a real ugly one. And as I said, look, there's a good chance. My my only concern with Charlo is, you, as he said, you look at the record and you keep and you keep wondering, is it is this the mirage? Yes, he's a champion. He beat a 43-year-old uh, Cornelius Brundridge, who has no power. He beat Wilkie Camford, who, once again, has no power. I mean, bro, this wasn't like, you know, Ch Canelo, who, Canelo, at least, as much as people hate him right now, he's had a steady diet of top 15 guys here and there. He's beaten Valar. He's beaten the Trout. Who is Jamal Charles beaten? That's the one th where you have. It's like he won the title because of the connections. He won and he beat a 43-year-old guy. I think this is going to be a big fight. I'm picking Trout, but as I said, I can see Charlo winning because he has that power. I'm just worried that when it gets tough, when he can't just walk in there and blast somebody away like he's done in his last several fights, will he you know, still have that mentality of, I can still do this? Or will Which uh, fights here we go? I think want to see to a fight which a lot of people really don't want to see. It's Lara versus uh, Vane's Smart Erosion. You, as you said, you made a trip to DC. You you spoke with a lot of guys. Everybody who knows boxing has said Eris Lara Lara is one of the most talented pure boxers. What kills people is that Eris Lara just never puts it together. It seems he's always too tricky, too cute. He'll circle around the old Cuban style. Is there a good chance he could lose this fight to Veins simply because Veins might just be more active? Veins might actually just throw more punches than Erislandi Lara. I totally agree with you that Ivanez Matarosian has the ability and gives the impression based off the last fight that, uh, as the aggressor. Um, and that has been Islandri Lara biggest downfall is that with all the talent that he has, all the skill that his fans and fanatics claim that he has, he doesn't finish the deal. You know, he eventually circles the ring too much. And I'm a huge, huge Laura fan. I'm a defender of Islandri Lara, but he's 
got to he's got to turn it around. He's got to go for the kill. A guy like Vanez Martirosian is a guy that Laura should be handling, if not by unanimous decision, uh, by knockout. Not because Vanez isn't a good fighter. Vanez is a great fighter with a great amateur background. He shared the ring with everyone, everyone. Austin Trout, Timothy Bradley, everyone. And as a pro, he has lately turned it around in the last, let's say, four years or so where he's faced guys like Laura and Demetrius Andre and Jamel Charlo and Ishe Smith and Willie Nelson. Those are good names to be fighting and good names to win and lose to. There's no shame in those wins. Jamel Charlo is the 154-pound pound title that was once held by Mayweather, so there's no shame in Bonnet's having that loss. But Jamel is up and coming. He's going for his first title shot. And he already holds a win over Vanez, whereas Laura fought him years before his younger stablemate in Jamal Charlo. So I just think it's statement time. You can't let your stablemate, you know, win a unanimous decision on a guy that you have to rematch. It is statement time. You know, um, the fact that he doesn't, he hasn't invested in learning English is upsetting to the fans. You know, they, they back this guy because he's the real deal. But, again, it's time to become a killer and, and not just a boxer. All the even these fights in the hands of the judges. You know, he had his opportunity with Saul Canelo Alvarez. I don't think he'll ever get a rematch unless he does things to warrant it. Who is the real Veins by erosion? That's, a, I guess, the question a lot of fans have. I mean, we saw him win against Demetrius Andrade, perfect example. Goes out. A lot of people think he's going to win this fight, and then he just—it's almost like you know the you know the old saying, million dollar talent, ten cent brain. You could say that with Beans. It's it's mean, but there are times he has brain farts in the ring. He just either isn't active enough. He does stupid stuff. He for all this talent that he came out with from the Olympics, you've seen it, Nestor. There are just times you look and you go, "What the hell are you doing?" Can you trust Veins here to follow the game plan? Or will he do something where you just sit there and go, yep, that's a that's a Veins Mart Erosion special right there? No, no, no. I think you don't trust him. You know, if you're a betting man, and you, you just watch this fight as a boxing fan. Uh, because you're right, you just don't ever know which Mart Erosion you're going to get. I mean, he looked good in the Willie Nelson fight. But then right after that, he lost to Charlo. I don't know what it is. Um, we'll just have to see, but that's the thing. He's never been able to cross over to that upper echelon. He's fighting the guy, like a, a win over Andre puts you in a certain topic of conversation because a lot of people consider Demetrius Andre a very skilled boxer. A win over Laura puts you in a certain topic of conversation, but he's not getting those wins. You look at this fight, and you, and I know people have criticized the PBC because sometimes you don't understand what their fights. I get this fight. If you're Laura, you need a big name. You need somebody. And it, as much as I know that Julian Williams wants to fight one of the Charlos, I'm guessing his management team's not keen on Lara. This is the best available guy. But first, Slotty Lara, you talked earlier, but he needs to do something. But he needs to make a statement. How much pressure is there on him? And does he understand that there's pressure for him to win? spectacularly, but he needs to go out there and just either knock out Bane's Smart Erosion or do what he did against Paul Williams and just for 12 rounds embarrass and brutalize him. I mean, does he understand that this is, in a lot of ways, his last stand? But if he doesn't win, people are going to be clamoring for, okay, just somebody beat him and get them the hell off the air, like a.k.a. Miguel Vasquez. Well, Miguel Vasquez is going to be back, I have you know, and, and that goes to my, my, my point, which is even if he, I, I don't believe that he feels that way because I think in this universe that we're living in now, our really at, reality is that guys like Gabriel Rosado um, are possible Canelo Alvarez opponents. David Lemieux, he's a Canelo Alvarez opponent. Curtis Stevens, Canelo Alvarez opponent, which means that a guy like Islam Laura, whether he has three or four losses, he's a big enough name to build someone's resume. Everyone needs a name. 
Jamal Charlo right now is going up versus Austin Trout, who's a common opponent with Laura because he needs a name and he can't fight Laura because they were stable mates or are stable mates, you know, because uh, Jamel is the one that left the Shields camp to go to the Derrick James camp, whatever else it is. But, yeah, you know, this is the universe that we live in. We go, we go from one fight where, as you said, both guys need a name to another fight where it's for a title. And I'm glad you brought up Derek James because it's, of course, uh, John Jackson versus Jer, uh, Jermel Charlo. People say he's the pure boxer. A lot of people said that he is the better boxer of the boxing twins. Yet, Jermel Charlo, there's just something. Whether it's he's too defensive, too technical, uh, he just there's always people who are saying he's just not exciting enough compared to his brother. Is John Jackson that fight where he can do something and then change our minds? Is, that, is, this, is this the kind of fight where he has a guy that he can probably knock out and look spectacular doing so? I'm not necessarily sure. Uh, this fight could be a sleeper, Chris. I know people are sleeping on John Jackson because they don't know much about him. But if you watch that Andy B fight uh, versus... John Jackson, well, he was beating Andy Lee until he got knocked out. And Jamel Charlo, while he's an identical twin, he doesn't have the power of Jamal. Now, he has been sitting down on his punches a little bit more since he trans, uh, you know, trans made the transition to the Derrick James camp over there uh, in Texas with, with Earl Spence. So maybe we can see a knockout. Maybe John Jackson has a bad chin. Or just maybe Andy Lee has real power, the type of power that he knocked out Cora above with, and John Jackson has a decent chin with good boxing skills, and we have a serious fight on our hands. But the problem is Jamel Charlo is more of a boxer than a puncher. So even if he sees that John Jackson, um, that he can't knock him out, he's going to get into boxer mode like the Gabriel Rosado fight, and it's going to take John Jackson to be a very good boxer or big puncher to stop Jamel from moving around or to outpoint Jamel while he is moving around. You look at John Jackson, uh, of course, everybody knows the, it's the family business with him. Uh, his brother, Julius Jackson, is a, con is a contender at 168, a French. Uh, his father, Julian Jackson, eight, probably one of the best athletes to ever come out of Virgin Islands and a man who, well, he could knock out a Brahma Bull if he, with one punch. As you said, though, they all share that sort of that, you know, the chin thing of, yeah, they're very good boxers. Yeah, they got power, but they can't take a punch. John, I think, can. I think the Andy Lee fight was just perfect punch, perfect timing. With John, as I said, he, you, with him, it's the same thing. Who has he beaten that you can look and go, all right, he's proven he can give Charlo a tough fight. Because the time, two times he's really stepped up and took it on top 15, top 20 guys. Unanimous decision loss to Willie Nelson 2012. Uh, the knockout to Andy Lee 2014. How big is this fight for him? Because if he loses, he's labeled as that dreaded regional guy. You know what I'm talking about. Well, he's a nice regional guy. You know, a Peter Manfredo, a... You know, Mauricio Herrera, they'll beat pretenders. They'll beat guys who are prospects. But when you get to the top ten, they're just just short of a mark. Well, um, I, I believe in, in the case of Jamel Charlo, he, he is the goods. You know, I, I don't know what it is that happened that – and he's given us the impression that he's kind of sidestepping. Because, you know, I, I, I just don't understand, like, a guy, an opponent like John Jackson at this point after Jamel Beatty, uh, Rosado, seems, you know, weird. I understand it's for a vacant title. But for John Jackson, this is all or nothing, right? I mean, we haven't seen much of him. Uh, his brother Julius also got knocked out not too uh, long ago on a PBC card in, in, in Texas as well. Um, it's do or die for both, really, because, again, the Jamel Charlo it, it, is what we would consider underachieving. His, his um, older brother, by seconds, became a champion before him with, with less fights and, and, and 
less barometer fights on it. Like, he didn't fight all the top names that Jamel fought. Jamel has been fighting consistent opposition, um, high level, not high level, but top tier opposition for a while now, and still hasn't got a title shot till now for a vacant one. Strikes me as odd. I know something that we don't know is, is the only thing I can assume. I mean, he, he still shows tremendous boxing skills, so we'll have to see Saturday. It's the third trainer also for Jamel Charles. It was first Lee Savannah, then they both went to Ronnie Shields. Uh, now Jamel is with uh, Derek James. Uh, is it safe to say Derek James, for him, this is a big fight? I know he's not fighting, but so far he's only been known as, well, yeah, you're the trainer for Errol Spence. Great, you have a great round prospect, but Errol Spence might just be that rare guy where you put him with anybody, uh, Barry Hunter, uh, Freddie Roach, and he'll still be the same thing. Is if, he, if Jamel comes out big, and wins by knockout. He, you know, shows something different. How much does that help Derek James in terms of start building his brand and recruiting more fighters to join him over in Texas? I mean, it could only be a positive thing. Uh, obviously, the knock on Jamel is that he boxes too much and he doesn't sit down on his punches. And since the transition to Derek James, we've been hearing the opposite. Now, this is his opportunity again because it's a big stage. It's a triple header. It's showtime. You know, you got. A lot of names on this card that are going to have boxing fans tuned in. So it's his opportunity to shine. It's make or break, I'm telling you. Well, once, once again, it's going to be tonight only only on Showtime. All the way from Nevada, Las Vegas, is going to be Charlo versus Jackson for the vacant uh, WBC title. you got for the IBF title, it's Austin Trout versus Jamal Charlo. And, of course, uh, the WB, uh, WBA title, of course, is... Arislandi Lara versus none other than Baines Martirosian. Before we go to all these titles, we've got to go to a big thing here that's changed the landscape of boxing. And I know, but you've been chomping at the bit. Everybody's chomping at the bit. Yes, it's right. Cats and dogs are now talking. You know, Republicans and Democrats are holding hands and seeing Kumbaya. Bob Aaron and Al Heyman have settled a lawsuit. And there's actually talk. They might be working together, not just for Mayweather and Pacquiao, too. I hope that doesn't happen. How big is this? For a casual fan who doesn't get it, you know, Nestor, how big is this that top rank in the PBC, Al Heyman, might actually be working together for more fights? Well, I, I, I don't know if we should be jumping the gun saying that just because it was released that the lawsuit has been settled, that these two entities will start to work together, but... Settling out of court is definitely a positive sign of potential fights. It has always struck me that Al Heyman has no issue making fights. I mean, we've just seen Dominic Wade on HBO. We've just seen Amir Khan fight Canelo. We've seen Edwin Rodriguez fight Ward on HBO. It seems like he's always putting his guys. I don't see, you know, any top-ranked guys ever fighting uh, on Showtime, actually, this is the first time that we're going to see, uh, I believe, uh, top rank versus Eddie Hearn with the Jesse vargas Kell Brook fight. If that is finalized, I'm hearing that it is already today, but if it is. Um, but, yeah, I think it's big things. I mean, obviously, when anybody can set their differences aside for the betterment of boxing to do good business is a good thing. The possibilities are endless. If these two companies can come together and make some fights, that means Timothy Bradley versus Keith Thurman, Sean Porter, uh, Kel Brook. I mean, so many possibilities would be just wonderful, really, right? As a boxing fan, I, I would be excited. I am excited for the possibility of it. I'm just not, you know, going to jump the gun and think that because the settlement came out, uh, which there are no details at all as to what exactly was settled upon. Um, yeah, but just because they, they agreed on something doesn't mean that we're going to get what we want. How much of it was this just a necessity? It's basically top rank reads of TV. Say what you want about Bob Aaron. There's a lot to be said. Todd Dubois is probably one of the smartest men in boxing, and he understands what's going on. HBO's budget has been slashed tremendously. For those who don't know, they don't have enough money to put on for certain boxing events. That's why you have 
uh, Victor Postal versus Terrence Crawford on pay-per-view. HBO doesn't have the money. That's why you're seeing more cards go to pay-per-view, because HBO does not have the money. So for top rank, how much of this is them looking going, okay, Veins need, you know, the C. Lomachenko needs fights. Terrence Crawford needs fights. Gilbert Ramirez needs fights. And there's only so much we can do with pay-per-view because Pacquiao's out the door. You really don't trust Crawford to sell a pay-per-view because he's not a talker. They don't have that, you know, that, that guy. They don't have that one guy that they can just, like a Pacquiao or even a, a Cotto, get them 800 million pay-per-view buys enough to, to have everybody fight him a car to make profit. How much of this is top rank going? For us to survive, we need to start looking outside the box. And if it's the PBC and, you know, working with Al and his money and Showtime, maybe it's time we just hold our nose and go, okay, time to swallow our pride a bit. Well, I think that's what's happening now. You know, I think it's, it's exactly what you're saying. Um, Bob got what he wanted. There was a settlement, you know. And he's optimistic, you know, and, and I quote here from an ESPN article, I'm optimistic that everybody is going to work together and make the big fights. I think there's a realization on everybody's part that in order to get the big fights, you're going to have to work together. And that's, uh, you know, Bob Aaron being quoted because it's just the bottom line. But what he did say in this article, um, with the little bit of details that came out on the settlement, is that um, the Mayweather-Pacquiao rematch was not, at all part of the reason that uh, the proceedings didn't go forward in court or that there was a settlement, that that had never been a reason. And that's a good thing, you know, to know that they could still be in court and still consider uh, a smooth, you know, transition when doing uh, another negotiation with a, with a fight with Mayweather or Pacquiao or anyone. But, you know, again, he's optimistic that they could work together. So that answers your question right there. That's the best thing to be heard. For the PBC, and this has always been the one big knock on them, and of course with Al Heyman, they don't do great with in terms of advertising. They don't do great in terms of promotion. I get it. They they are not the most media friendly people. That's just the way they've done business. Their feeling is we put on the fights, we give you the fights. That's not our job to be the dog and pony show. How big is it for them having Top Rank, who went you know love them or hate them, Top Rank knows how to sell a fight. They know how to promote a fight. They know how to get it out there. How much does that help for the PBC going forward with NBC fights possibly with top rank, CBS fights with top rank, knowing you have somebody, a promotion, that is big enough, talented enough, and they know how to pitch a fight, how to sell it, and get the media well, talking about it? It's always a good thing, Chris, when you can have a veteran or a teacher, a mentor in the game teach you the ins and outs of your game, you know. Um, love him or hate him, Top Rank's been in business for years, decades. So, and again, if there is no war, there's unity. And when there's unity, you know, the word can spread and, and travel faster. So if, if Top Rank and any promotion are working together, I think that the promotion is only bigger because now both entities are promoting that one said venue or event. Well, you mentioned the good news. You mentioned the big fights. Let's talk about the bad news. And that's uh, the cancellation of Pavekin versus Wilder. Uh, let's face it. There's no winner in this. Uh, Pavekin loses because he'll probably be suspended. He probably will be, you know, have his ranking taken away from. And at 34 years old, he can't afford to have one year of inactivity. Him overall for his legacy. I mean, how for him as a drug cheat who... This might not have been his first time. He might have been doing more stuff all the way back since, you know, before Klitschko. Well, Chris, what I've learned in my years in, in boxing is uh, things don't necessarily stick, man. Uh, boxing fans are fickle, and it's more what have you done for me. I'm for in right now, yeah, he's a cheat. Right now, this isn't good for him. Everything you said is correct. He's 33 years old. Uh, you know, a year out of the ring is a bad thing. And the uh, only thing I disagree about this not being good for anyone, I think it's good for Wilder. I think now Wilder doesn't have to fight in enemy territory. I think now Wilder gets to come back home. He showed to the uh, conscious and logical boxing fans that he was more than willing to go to 
foreign soil and defend his title. Uh, unfortunately, his opponent didn't want to have the fight on even playing field, and we're here. So I think Wilder loses nothing. If anything, he gains by showing there were many, many people who thought he would vacate his title instead of facing Pavekin, let alone, let alone going to Russia to, to defend his title. So I think Wilder comes out with a couple of gold stars around his name. You see, I, I disagree only because... We, we had Wilder on the show. We've done, we've done interviews here with him last call. He's always said, I want my legacy. I want a big legacy. I want to be Ali. I want to be Riddick Bowe, Evander Holyfield, where you are a mainstream name. He wants that one fight where it's a signature fight. Love it or hate it, he was confident he was going into Russia. He was confident that there was going to be a fight. He was confident he was going to knock out Alexander Povetkin. Yes, he doesn't. He doesn't go and fight any territory. But who does he fight now? I mean, you're looking at who he has: Gerald Washington. Who right now there is a stink on Washington after his back-to-back performances against Chambers and before that Amir Mansoor. I don't know if he can really make a fight between those two because the fans are just going to puke on Washington. You look at the WBC rankings, and who else do you want to put him up with? What's the difference? What's the difference between Washington and Brazil? The difference between Brazil is Brazil at least has a knockout against Amir Mansour. It was a fun drag-out knockout win. Granted, you know, it, and Brazil is already going to be taken with Anthony Joshua. But his knockout has an asterisk. First of all, he was losing the fight, and, and the knockout came because Amir Mansour's jaw was broke. He couldn't continue. It wasn't like he stopped him. No, but it was still a he fun did, fight. He did stop him because of the... The broken jaw, don't get me wrong. Technically, he stopped him because of the broken jaw. Amir Mansour decided he could not continue. But, you know, you're saying knock out. Like, you know, we give the impression that he slept him or something. And that's not what happened. And that fight, did, it wasn't easy for him. So, Brazil, it's not like I got over Mansour. He was losing that fight. True. In my opinion, anyway. But there's a difference. I mean, it was a fun fight to watch. Washington fights weren't fun. And you look at the rest of the WBC rankings. Well, I mean, I, I don't think that Washington is even an option. That's just you and I, hypothetically speaking. But um, I think now that Povetkin isn't an option, there are possibilities. I mean, today Joseph Parker just got a good win, unanimous decision over Carlos Takam. Um, there is, well, it's, it's Tikam. Uh, they, they made that clear on the announcement team, it's Tikam. Um, but, yeah, there, there's other heavyweights out there. Max Kellerman is, is very happy with Joseph Parker, right? So that's a fight that is a possibility. It Tyson is, Fury, Wilder, possibilities. It is a possibility, but the problem is, if you're Parker, you're looking at Anthony Joshua. That's the big money fight right now because Joshua brings in more money overseas. You're looking at right now for Wilder where, let's say, fights you can reasonably make. And we'll, we'll keep Parker as an option. The rest of them are... Remains to Vern, who Wilder beat. Kubrat Pulov won't travel to America. Johan Dumfaust, Andy Ruiz, David Hay, Brian Jennings, Blake Scott, Arthur Spilka, Eric Molina, Derek Chisora, Ruslan Shigayev, Gerald Washington. Those are the rest of your top 14 guys. There's no, with the exception of maybe Hay, but he's going to want big money, and that's a bitch to deal with right there. Is there anybody there that the PBC can make a fight with on short notice? Because they won't get a fight with Wilder probably in June, July. That's their plan, they said. That they can make and that can look good, but Wilder can look good at and help his brand. The Pavekin fight, for all we said, that was the one. If he had beaten Pavekin, he could then pound his chest and go, you know what, I'm better than Fury, I'm better than Joshua, I went to enemy territory, knocked the guy out who wasn't old or wasn't, you know, asleep. He was just a guy who was in his prime semi and I knocked his ass out. To me, I think, as I said, Wilder, Wilder, Povetkin postponement loses uh, is a loser for all because Wilder lost that chance of having that signature win. He did lose the chance, but he he can't be faulted for it. So I'm not, not saying it's fault. I'm just whatever, saying whatever is available. He has to fight whatever is available. Now it's not his fault that the person that everyone wanted him to fight ended up being. In this scandal, and I'm not blaming him. This, that's the whole, that's a whole separate story. I don't think he's at fault at all. I'm just saying there isn't a winner for this whole pullout because 
Wilder misses out on his big moment that he wanted. Pavekin screws the whole thing up. The promoters lose out on money. And the fans lose out because a fight which was a lot of people thought was going to be a possible fight of the year candidate is now gone. Chris, Chris, but what about uh, Pulev? Pulev just got a win over Chisora. He previously was on HBO where he lost to Vladimir Klitschko. That's a good barometer fight. It you is. Know, Luis but... Ortiz doesn't have a fight. Lucas Brown doesn't have a fight. I don't know if he has settled his own He's negative suspended to or be positive drug test. You know, Antonio Tarver is there. You're mentioning uh, Tarver now. Yeah. Oh my God, we're not we're not we're not scraping the bottom of the barrel here. Well, th- th- I'm giving you top ten, man. This is top ten. This, th- I can't I can't invent nor birth another heavyweight. Top ten is Antonio Tarver. No, Lucas I understand Brown. that. As I said, look, I... and Anthony Joshua, Herbert Pula. Wilder, Pavekin, Klitschko, and Fury. So you tell me, Pavekin's out for being dirty. So is Brown for being dirty. Tyson and Klitschko are tied up in a contract. Pulev is free. Joshua's tied up. And he's not even fighting a top 10. Because Brazil is in top 10. Brazil is number 19. So, you know, he's busy. Lewis is free. But he's Golden Boy, who has a lawsuit with Al Heyman pending, three hundred million, right? I, there's some, there's some dude that's number nine that I, I've never even heard of in my life. You know, I can't even begin to pronounce his name. Tepper is the last name. So and he's also you know, and, then, yeah. and then Malik Scott is eleven. Joseph Parker is twelve. Glasscoff, who, who's also out with injured team. Chisora, who lost to Pulev. A week ago is 14. Martin, who got knocked out by Joshua, is 15. Molina, who lost to Wilder already. Stavern, who lost to Wilder already. That's 16, 17, 18 is the Lapas, who also lost to Wilder. Like, <laughs> Dominic Brazil, number 19, tied up. There is no heavyweight. No, I, I understand that. That's why I said... There's... A, you If you are a, if a PBC, you're scrambling. I mean, you might be looking at a guy... A Trevor Bryan, a a guy. No, like... no, you know, you're not scrambling. What you do is you do put him in there with a uh, Antonio Tarver because there's still a market for Antonio Tarver. But you get him knocked out. You give Wilder another name. You give him another name. That's what they're doing with Anthony Joshua. They're building his resume. Why do you think he's defending his title versus Dominic Garcia? No, I I agree. I... As I said, well, this for the overall thing, and I said this before with Wilder, this was not a win for him because this was something he wanted. So with the Pavekin, he went from having, you know, that big gold medal, that everything he wanted, one step towards becoming the next Muhammad Ali, possibly in his mind and in a lot of fans' minds, to back to the drawing board and waiting on Joshua and Fury, which that could take a while. But we got to wrap this up. Once again, tonight it's going to be only on Showtime. It's going to be... Charlo versus Trout. It's going to be Charlo versus Jackson. And, of course, Lara versus Martirosian. And once again, I want to thank my wonderful uh, boxing insider here, uh, Nestor over the Boxing Voice. And you can check him out almost every day and every night only on theboxingvoice.com where they talk boxing, the politics, the you know, interviews and all that. Once again, Nestor, always a pleasure having you here on the show. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for having me. Uh, players, those all ours. Uh, once again, stay tuned for more great action here only on LastCallRadioShow.com.